<laughs> okay, is everybody good? Um, that's very exciting. And I felt for a long time that uh, we in the psychology and, and neuroscience of event cognition um, have a huge amount uh, to borrow from the, the um, computer vision community. And I think that we may have some, uh, some discoveries that, that could be actually be helpful in thinking about uh, machine action recognition. So um, I'm, I'm excited to have the opportunity to share some of that. For the next 40 minutes or so, what I want to do is give you a lightning tour of what we know about humans perceive, understand, and remember everyday events. Um, my lab worries a lot about how the brain gets this stuff done, and I'm going to go light on that today. But I'm happy to, take, you know, to, to go off on any tangents that you want to ask about the nurse. Um, just an intuition pump that's going to organize what I have to say today. And um, I want to set against each other two long-running traditions in, uh, in, the, in the psychology of complex understanding. And one tradition is a representationalist tradition epitomized by people like David Marr that says that we construct within our minds re-representations of the external environment or models. And opposed to that is an anti-representationalist tradition uh, epitomized by um, the behaviorists and people like James Gibson that says, basically, the world is out there representing itself perfectly well, thank you very much. And if I need to check the value of some feature of the world, I can just look at it. And I can use my interactions with the world to guide my behavior. I'm going to take in a representationalist stance, and I want to say a couple words about why I think that is worth um, pushing. The basic idea uh, is that, that one of the things that the human cognitive system is doing all the time is building a representation that we call the current working model of your immediate environment and who are the actors and what are their goals and what are they up to. What's the spatiotemporal framework within that activity, within which that activity takes place? What are the entities and objects and the other salient features of the situation? And I just want to emphasize, you know, the anti-representationalist view is that this is weird because building such a representation is expensive and it's unwieldy, and the world is giving you a kind of representation that you could use itself. But the hypothesis is that the variables that we get from our sensory surfaces from early sensation don't carve the world at its joints. And that if we re-represent them, do a nonlinear transformation that abstracts and represents things in the appropriate manifold, that enables more effective uh, predictive processing. You can do better learning, and you can do better anticipation. And that has adaptive win. So just here's a toy example. Suppose that Rebecca and Zach are uh, having breakfast, and Rebecca is passing uh, milk to Zach. And then Zach takes the milk uh, and pours the milk. Um, so you know, we could code these things in, this, in a set of low-level features like uh, Rebecca's hand velocity, Zach's hand velocity, joint angles, um, maybe uh, torques on the muscles so we could recover from the dynamics, something about the kinematics of the activity. We can maybe represent contact relations. And if you do that, you know, as you march through time on a very short time scale, there's lots and lots of stuff that's changing. And a lot of those trajectories are going to be nonlinear, complex, hard to learn. Whereas, if, on the other hand, if at the front end, you do some extra work to re-represent this thing as something like uh, Rebecca is giving milk to Zach. I think I switched it. I think I had Zach giving 
milk to Rebecca. But Rebecca's giving milk to Zach. Rebecca's holding the milk. Then Zach's holding the milk at some later point of time. These trajectories are simpler. The rate of change of the features is generally slower. And the trajectories are smoother. They're more learnable. Okay? So that's the basic hypothesis is that because there is a real underlying structure to the world in terms of things like giving and holding and pouring and chairs and milk and tables, that it's worthwhile reconstructing that structure at the front end so that you can do learning categorization, knowledge acquisition, and prediction based on that set of features. OK. This leads to a set of computational problems. So if a model like this is going to be useful, it needs to be updated at just the right times. If we update too infrequently, then it's going to go stale and it's going to lead to bad predictions. So if you've got a model of Rebecca and Zach having breakfast after they get up and go to work, you need to update that model. If you update too frequently, then that model just winds up being a picture of what's right in front of you. And the Gibsonians are exactly right that it's not adding any value over what you could get by just reading off the situation. Uh, perhaps most interesting to me, if you update in the wrong places, what kind of event models do you wind up with? Do you wind up with, with representations that don't carve the world at its joints? Um, and so we've been interested over the last few years in what's the control architecture for updating your current working model of the world. And the basic. Um, the basic computational hypothesis that we've been exploring is that a good unsupervised signal for event model updating is prediction error. So if you are using your current working model to drive predictions about what's going to happen in the near future, and you monitor um, how well those predictions are working out for you and update when uh, prediction error spikes, that that's a good way of keeping appropriate event mo model representations. So um, the cognitive boxological theory version of this looks like this. It says that sensory and perceptual processing operates through a set of hierarchical stages. So like in the visual system, we go from V1, primary visual cortex, to secondary visual cortex, split into two uh, visual streams, one dorsal stream optimized for action control, another ventral stream optimized for recognition. And at each stage in this hierarchy, things become longer time scale, more abstracted, larger spatial scale. And in the later stages of, this, of these processing hierarchies, things become increasingly more forward oriented in time, more predictive. And this is good because this allows you to do things like jump out of the way before the lion grabs you. Um, it's helpful as you're forming this hierarchy of representations to have a stable model of what's uh, happening in your current situation, your current working model, to bias that sensory and perceptual processing. You continuously compare the outputs of the later stages of processing with what actually happens to generate an error signal. And then when error spikes, you, um, uh, you gate open the inputs to these event models, opening them up to the early stages of sensory and perceptual processing. Otherwise, they're gated off and giving you a stable representation. At those times, you also bring on information from your memory, from long-term knowledge about how this kind of activity typically unfolds, and from your episodic memories. So um, if you look at the behavior of this kind of system over time, what you wind up with is hopefully long periods in which prediction error is low, punctuated by spikes in prediction error, at which point you move in a relatively discrete fashion from event state to event state to event state. Um, we, early in the game, implemented this in a simple connectionist network. So this is a gated network uh, where the core is this three-layer feed-forward network. And then you've got this set of gated recurrent uh, units. The model lived in this world where it watched these motion capture movies of a guy doing a sequence of everyday actions. Each action was more or less deterministic, but um, could, they could occur in any order. And its job was to predict the next frame. And so when you implement this prediction error based gating, <coughs> what you find is that there is a reliable signal there that can tell you good times to gate. And that implementing this architecture and taking advantage of that signal 
improves performance over the feed forward network. And interestingly, it does so in a qualitatively different fashion than um, like an Elman style simple recurrent network, uh, which continuously updates uh, the hidden unit representations on each frame. So it beats down different parts of the airspace than does a simple recurrent network. More recently, um, uh, my collaborators, uh, Nick Franklin and Sam Gershman and a couple others of us have been working on a, the kind of latest, greatest version of this idea. And the big thing that this model adds, um, it, it, it starts off with a core of recurrent, uh, gated recurrent networks, but it adds on to it a quasi-symbolic mechanism for learning event schemas. And it's a, one of the first <laughs> computationally explicit accounts of event schema learning that really scales. So I'm pretty excited about this model. And serving the development of this model is kind of one of the motivations for um, some of the new work that we've been doing lately. Okay, so this view has some pretty straightforward implications for behavior and for the neuroscience of event perception. So one thing it says is that the system is constantly segmenting ongoing activity into meaningful events, whether you're thinking about event segmentation or not. Another thing it entails is that in naturalistic activity, event segmentation, event boundaries tend to occur when more stuff in the world is changing. So as long as the features out in the world are stable, you can be kind of like a meteorologist and just predict that the next thing is gonna be kind of like what you got now. But when things change, then there's more opportunity for uh, prediction errors. Um, it entails that if we go in and directly measure prediction error, that ought to correspond with where people perceive event boundaries. And it entails that what the systems that are building long-term memories in our brains have to access is going to be determined in part by what's captured by these current working models. So that the segments that we perceive online are going to leave footprints on our long-term memories. So let me just say a little bit about each of these. Um, there's now a large database suggesting that when people are comprehending everyday activity, they're spontaneously segmenting it into meaningful units that correspond more or less to the phenomenological impression that one event has ended and another has begun. So um, to give you a sense of this, I'm going to ask you to perform a task that we use often in the lab. This is a task that was developed back in the 70s by the social psychologist Darren Knutson. And it's really simple, but kind of weird. So this is what we tell people. We um, usually have them push a button instead of clapping. But what I'm going to ask you to do is to clap whenever, in your judgment, one meaningful unit of activity ends and another begins. There's no right or wrong answer. I'm simply interested in your judgments. Okay? And we can tell people <coughs> um, to segment at various grains. So here I'm going to ask you, so we can get data quickly, to segment at the smallest grain that you find natural and meaningful. So pick off the smallest units that you find natural and meaningful. Okay. I think you get the idea. So you may have had the impression when I asked you, when I told you about this task, what does he mean? What's a natural and meaningful unit? How do I know if I got it right or wrong? We do this with undergraduates. They're quite anxious, right? Because they want to do well. They want to please us. Um, but in fact, with approximately zero trials of training, we find that people can do this in a way that is easy and natural and leads to high levels of intersubjective agreement. And that is good evidence that this is something that their brains were tapping into something that their brains were doing all the time before we asked them to do this task. Um, across a lot of studies from my lab and others, you find high levels of intersubjective agreement on the very first trial. You also find high hierarchical organizations such that the boundaries between short units are a subset of the boundaries between coarser grained units. And if I had you watch a movie like that in the MRI scanner, 
with no instructions other than to pay attention, and then pulled you out and asked you to do that clapping task, and then we time locked your brain activity while you were doing the naive viewing to your behavior, we'd find that there was large phasic activity across the cortex at those points that you would have told us were event boundaries had we asked you. So that tells us that there's some big chunk of computation that's happening in a way that's time locked with the perception of these event boundaries. And we think that part of what that reflects is the propagation of an error signal and the consequent updating of a working model. Okay, and this is just <coughs> one recent example of what that looks like. So here uh, is a lateral and medial view of the cortex uh, in the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere. And this is just a heat map indicating the kinds of places where we see these phasic responses. Um, and uh, for those of you who are aficionados of the brain's default mode, this is the posterior part of the default mode and also uh, some areas in lateral frontal cortex, especially on the right, which are consistently activated. And this is what the time courses typically look like. If you time lock to the point at which the event boundary occurs, you see a, a ramp up that peaks about eight to 10 seconds after the event boundary would have been identified. Um, and the lag between this point and this point reflects the fact that these are blood responses that take a while to evolve in response to a burst of neural activity. This is also typical that we see larger responses for coarse grain than for fine grain event boundaries, though you don't always see that. Okay. And these responses are surprisingly robust. So you get them for movies of everyday activities like this. If we show people commercial cinema, you see the same thing. If we just have people reading stories in the scanner, one word at a time, uh, where there's no, um, there's no confounding changes in the visual stimulus, it's just one word at a time, you see almost all of this system. You miss a little bit of the early visual areas, but the rest hangs in there. Okay. So how about this next point that event models are updated, it changes. Um, early on in the game, we went deep down this rabbit hole of looking at uh, low level uh, movement changes. So you can show people um, simple little animations like this or live action where we can uh, calculate biological motion from motion tracking the actor. Um, and what you find is that when features like the distance between important points or the veloc relative velocity, acceleration, jerk, any of these features of movement are changing a lot, those tend to be event boundaries. For more complex narrative materials like uh, this commercial movie, this is the Red Balloon uh, from Albert Lamaurice, um, then you have features like, like going from outside to inside, introducing new characters, adopting new goals. When those kinds of more conceptual features are changing, you see, um, you see increases in segmentation. Um, once you're uh, coding more conceptual features like those, you can uh, look at the, at the textual materials. So if you read something like Mrs. Birch went through the front door into the kitchen, that's a change in spatial location. Mr. Birch came in, that's a change in characters. <coughs> Those kinds of changes are associated with the perception of event boundaries as well. So segmentation is uh, associated with changes in perceptual and conceptual features. And these are really strong relationships. And importantly, in naturalistic activity, all of these features are correlated with each other. Um, and that's an important thing to keep in mind. OK, uh, so recently to get at this, um, we've been uh, building big corpora and part of the idea is to have a data set that we can feed the model so that the model can watch the same stimuli that the people watch. So we've been filming and Matt is going to talk about this in his poster this afternoon, Matt, my colleague Matt Bezdek back there. Um, so we've been filming activities with two high resolution cameras and a Kinect um, and it's, 24, it's now up to 25 hours of video um, constructed in a way uh, that is supposed to mimic the structure of typical activity by a set of observers. So we've got multiple actors doing multiple performances of multiple activities. So here's the same actor doing a bunch of performances of one of the activities. So Matt will give the details of that. And the idea of, of corpora like this is to allow us to look at behavior and brain activity on a moment by moment 
basis that can be benchmarked against computational models that can be trained on a data set that's big enough to capture uh, the structure of what we think is going on in the human. Okay, so that's kind of consistent with the idea that it's updating based on prediction error, um, but uh, we've also undertaken some ways of looking directly at prediction error. So here's an explicit prediction task <coughs> where we take everyday event movies for which we have lots of segmentation. So we know where the event boundaries are and we ask people to watch the movies and then stop them from time to time and ask them what's going to happen next. So I'm going to ask you what's going to happen next by showing you a couple pictures. There we go. Okay, uh, so how many think that the left picture shows what's going to occur in five seconds? Raise your hands. Okay, how many think the right? Okay, so there's a bare majority for the right, which is the right answer in this case. And so what we do is um, stop it from time to time, ask people, uh, and then restart. And the, the alternatives come from alternate takes where in this case, she was waxing, washing the car, but the alternate came from a movie in which she was waxing the car. Um, we've also been using indirect measures of prediction where we don't have to interrupt the ongoing activity. So here, the pink dot's going to show you, and this is slowed down by a factor of two, where someone was looking as they were watching this movie. And the yellow boxes show you objects that she's about to uh, touch. And what you see is that the eyes land on objects a little bit before an actor's hand gets there. This is a ubiquitous phenomenon in, uh, in the dynamics of eye gaze during natural viewing, namely that we look predictively. But we do so a little bit less if that contact is happening near an event boundary. So the person is less able to predict which object she's going to grab. So on the explicit task, what we find is that people's ability to correctly choose which of those two pictures is the right one is knocked down a bit if they're trying to predict around across an event boundary. Um, and if we do that in the scanner, um, what we find is phasic increases in a, a set of brain areas that are associated with signaling prediction error, particularly the midbrain dopamine system, uh, when you're trying to make a prediction in that situation where it's more difficult. And in the predictive looking case, what we find is that people get to the target objects more slowly and with less accuracy uh, when that activity, that action, that reach is happening near an event boundary. Okay, so, um, um, so if what's happening is that people are spontaneously segmenting in response to spikes in prediction error and that's updating a working representation, that's going to affect what the long-term memory systems and our event learning systems have available to capture about uh, the structure, larger structure of ongoing activity. <coughs> and we've looked at it this few, few ways. I want to start with a demonstration of the updating phenomenon in relatively short-term memory. Anybody recognize this film? It's uh, Jacques Tati, um, it's a film called Mon Uncle, it's about Paris after the war. And it's great because, I mean, Tati is brilliant, but um, it's got all kinds of objects and actions coming and going. There's some dialogue, as you heard, you don't need to know the dialogue. And we know that when he walks through that door, a huge number of our norming subjects tell us that's an event boundary. Okay, and as a result, we hypothesized that it would be hard for you to remember which of those objects was on the screen exactly five seconds before I could stop the clip. So how many will vote cat? Raise your hands. Okay, how many will vote chair? Okay, we're gonna try that again. How many would vote cat? You gotta pick one. How many vote chair? Okay, and so that was just about it, chance, which is typical for this one. The answer is chair. We restart the movies so that they can see that it was sitting there right in the middle of their visual field. <coughs> And the, the idea is that because, that when he walks through that door, you experience a spike in prediction error because your visual system and your conceptual system is less able to predict what the input's gonna be. You update your working model, and if chair had been in your inventory previously, it's with some probability deleted from that new model. 
Um, and what we find is that in general, when people are trying to reach back, it, the, the lag between when the object goes off the screen and when we test is always exactly five seconds. So this is a very short delay. But trying to remember something that happened just five seconds ago can be astonishingly difficult if five seconds ago is no longer part of the current event. Under those circumstances, there are, and it's interesting what they are, circumstances when you can actually reach back across that event boundary quite nicely. But when you can do that, you activate these parts of your medial temporal lobes, the hippocampus and surrounding structures, um, which are traditionally thought of as long-term working memory structures. So if you're familiar um, uh, with the famous case of uh, patient HM, uh, uh, described in Sue Corkin's book, Permanent Present Tense, or if you remember the movie Memento, these are people with medial temporal lo lobe lesions. And that's characterized by an inability to form new long-term memories. That system also turns out to be critical for remembering stuff that was very recent, but just not the current event. Okay. Um, segmentation and its relationship to long-term memory uh, is, I would argue, a really fundamental part of our phenomenology, phenomenology of everyday experience and our ability to perform adaptively. What I've told you about so far uh, is really describing this system at its apex. So we're looking mostly in the data that I've showed you so far at the performance of healthy college students. And they're doing all this stuff really well. Um, but this is a set of cognitive abilities that has an extended developmental trajectory. So when we look at children in like the late um, uh, uh, primary school years, they're still getting better at this. It um, decays appreciably um, in, uh, with healthy aging, starting at a relatively early age. It's further impaired in, in conditions including Alzheimer's disease post-traumatic stress disorder and traumatic brain injury. And critically, across all of these groups and within groups from individual to individual, um, effective segmentation is asso strongly associated with better uh, subsequent memory. So in one individual differences study, we measured, I think it was 208 people on a two and a half hour cognitive battery and then had them segment uh, a set of events and remember those events later, if I take two people who are totally equated for all of the baseline cognitive measures, the one who segments in a way that's more normative remembers more after a short delay than the person who segmented in a way that was less normative. <coughs> uh, my colleague Heather Bailey did this cool study a few years back where um, we had people perform a set of everyday activities in the laboratory. And these were normed by Myrna Schwartz and, his, and her colleagues to investigate uh, disorders of action performance. And in a set of uh, people with Alzheimer's disease, what we found is that those people who could segment one set of activities better were better able to perform this totally different set of activities. And again, this is after equating for their, cog their clinical status. So, this leads to the question, uh, if this, these relationships between segmentation and other aspects of cognition are so strong, like can we do anything, right? Do we just have to live this with this or can we use this front end encoding mechanism as a leverage point to improve memory? And this was like particularly salient to me because I've got a, a bunch of friends in my department back in St. Louis who are experts on uh, memory improvement, mostly in an academic context. And like since, you know, Rome, we've known that if you want to remember something like a list of words or a set of name-face associations, there are mnemonic strategies, such as the method of loci, that are highly effective. They may be annoying to perform, but they work. They totally work. <coughs> so if you need to study for exams or memorize word lists, we've got techniques for you. But if somebody comes into my office and says to me, you know, hey, professor, um, my kid's getting married next week, and I really want to burn that experience into my brain. What's a good encoding manipulation to better learn a, a, a real life event that I might actually care about, not a word list? We got nothing. So, um, so I've been pretty interested in this for practical reasons as well. And I'm going to tell you, we've explored a couple uh, interventions. They all seem to work, but I'm going to tell you about the, the dumbest, simplest one. <laughs> 
Um, oh, and you know, if this works for memory, maybe it'll also work for the, for the action performance side of things. We haven't tested that. <coughs> okay, so uh, what Shaney Flores did when he was in the lab was showed people um, uh, movies of everyday activity. So this is the kitchen movie that you saw. This is a guy setting up for a party. This is a guy planting a set of house plants. And um, we ran a series of five studies with uh, large ends. So these were, some were run in the lab, some were run online using Amazon Mechanical Turk. It's about 1,400 subjects total. And we tested a, a variety of delays ranging from no delay at all. So you watch a movie and then we a immediately ask you to recall it and then ask you to recognize pictures from it to a very short delay where we watch three movies then we ask you to recall the first one then the second one then the third one. Uh, test you a day later, a week later, a month later. And uh, we measured memory by asking you to recall what happened in the movies and to recognize pictures from the movies. And the way I'm going to visualize these data uh, are like this. So here's recognition accuracy as a function of what encoding condition you were in. So you might have segmented or just been told to try and remember as much as you can. Or in some of the experiments we ran a control condition because I, I was worried that um, just having to sit there and push a button might have both positive and negative consequences for encoding. Right? It's going to keep you attending and on task but it also gives you a secondary task. And if segmentation is effective, well, then you might find that, um, that performance on this memory test would be higher than the other two conditions. Make sense? Okay. And these are real data. So this is what you get in one of the 10 minute uh, delay conditions. But let's zoom out and look at all 1,400 subjects. And what you find is if you test immediately um, that, in fact, just paying attention and trying to remember as much as you can is better. And what that's probably doing is allowing you to shove more into relatively short-term sensory memory systems. But those decay really quickly, such that by a 10-minute lag, uh, segmenting to encode works better. And that st sticks in for up to a month. So a month later, just having done this button pressing task le leads to more effective uh, memory. So now we're interested in things like, can we do things like instrument stimuli to facilitate that? Can we train people so that they habitually engage in more effective updating such that it improves their memory? <coughs> OK. So that's going to get me to the last question that I want to uh, take on today, which is like, why do we have these uh, memory systems at all? If you look at what most of my colleagues do in the lab, you would think that the reason that people have episodic or episodic-like memory is to tell you about what they did in the lab a few minutes ago. And in particular, to search memory for arbitrary conjunctions of materials with other materials or materials with a context. So you know, if I ask you, was this word on a list, I'm asking you to engage in a deliberate memory search for the association between a set of features and a context. And I don't doubt that we can do that. And I don't doubt that particularly for humans in our like highly industrialized information economy culture, that that's a thing, that that's important. But I don't think, I think that a lot of these systems are widely shared across the mammalian taxa. And I don't think that most of the system was developed under a, an adaptive pressure to do that kind of task. I think what it was more, much more likely to have been developed uh, in response to is the kind of situation where you walk into something and it has feature overlap with something else that happened recently. And if you can retrieve representations, call back up event models from those related previous situations, that's going to allow you to improve your performance. So we're talking about involuntary auto-associative retrieval of related uh, previous instances. Um, the, uh, the theorist, I think, who's articulated this most uh, effectively is uh, Bill Murray. This is, from, this is from the film Groundhog Day. So he's experienced this activity at this point. At this point, he's experienced this activity. He's lived this day over and over again about 50 times. As a result, he's able to use his memory for the exact timing of this drop-off 
uh, on the previous instances to zip in and predict exactly when they'll be di distracted and to lift the bag of coins. Okay, so the reason that we have event memory is to steal from armored trucks. <laughs> <coughs> Now, in our normal event memories, like we don't get to experience the thing a hundred times, but we do, I think it's often the case, you know, I, I, sh you know, I show up in London after not having been here for a few years, and, um, you know, and I, I uh, wander out of uh, um, Liverpool Station, and then the next day I wander out of the same tube stop, and if I can bring back the representation from the previous day. That's going to guide my footsteps. And that's most of the time good. But in London, everything's always under construction. So actually, the second day, things might be totally different. I've also got to cope with that. And if I can um, bring back what happened on that first day and then use it to adapt to what happens on the second day, then I'm really going to be golden. So here's a. Um, Here's an experiment that was designed to get at that situation. This is a stimulus set that we've been using for a bunch of different things lately. Uh, people watch a day in the life of my colleague Sarah Essel. So here, this is toward the end of the day. She's getting out of the car and coming back into her house. And the whole movie, this one includes about 54 of these everyday actions sequenced into a thing that starts when she gets up in the morning and ends when she goes to bed at night. And then we tell her, um, you know, Sarah's an academic, so her uh, every day is kind of like the last. So we're going to ask you to watch another day in Sarah's life. And you're going to notice that a lot of the things she does are about the same, because that's life. Um, so she gets out of the car again. She, you know, and the idea is that when you see her get out of the car, you might uh, bring back that previous event representation, leading you to predict that she's going to unlock the door and go inside. Right? But some of you would have noticed that uh, that second day she did things a little bit differently, whereas on the first day she unlocked the deadbolt, on the second day she unlocked the doorknob. And so our hypothesis is that if you're bringing back that previous event representation and it's guiding your predictions about what's going to happen next, you're going to make a prediction error at this point. Your eyes are going to go here and then have to correct when her hand goes there. <coughs> so what we find is, so we we see these movies with both repeated events and changed events, and also some control activities that only happened on the second day. Compared to the controls, people look faster and more accurately at that deadbolt on the, well, it'd be in this case the doorknob on the second day. But when things change, they make errors in predictive looking. And the cool thing is that those errors are associated with better memory for the fact that it changed and for what the change feature was on day two. So having made this prediction error right before you have to encode that she opened the doorknob leads to better encoding of the information about the doorknob. Um, and uh, uh, my colleague David Stowarczyk just finished up this study that we're writing up where we use pattern-based functional MRI to look at event-specific information being reinstantiated as you're anticipating. So we have you watching along. We encode the pattern of activity in your posterior medial memory network while you're encoding that first uh, opening of the deadbolt. Then we look to see the extent to which that pattern gets reinstantiated as you're anticipating her going back for the deadbolt. The extent to which you do that predicts how well you remember the mismatching information when she, uh, when she uh, opens the doorknob. So the basic idea here is that during comprehension of day two, memory information for day one can drive predictions about how things are going to go. And most of the time, this is great. This is adaptive because most of the time, things go the way things usually go. But when things change, this leads to prediction errors, which is a bummer in the short term. But it can lead in the long term, if the system is functioning appropriately, to a bunch of positive consequences. So error drives learning in this situation as in many others. So in the short term, it's going to lead you to update your event model. It can lead to more effective integration of the prediction and the error into the memory of day two. So if things go well, your memory for day two is not just a memory for what happened when she, when she unlocked the doorknob. It's a memory that includes the traces of retrieving deadbolt, experiencing a prediction error, and then having to correct. 
And that kind of recursive representation, if you have it, is fantastic. It tells you what happened on day one, what happened on day two, and the relationship between the two in time. It can allow you to overcome interference between related contexts by integrating them, improving learning and memory. Okay, so just to conclude, uh, <clears throat> what I've tried to suggest is that cognition depends on structured representations of events, that a, a computational mechanism for building and updating these uh, is gating based on prediction error, and that entails that when you experience event boundaries, it's going to be when things change, and when you experience prediction errors. Event model updating leaves deep footprints on long-term memory. We see this both in the immediate updating of working memory and in the structure of long-term memory and its relation to perception. Um, and one of the things that this allows us to do is to better take advantage of the relationship between our systems for perceptual prediction and uh, our long-term memories, allowing us to deploy long-term memory in the service of better prediction. Okay, so I will thank my lab mates and take a few questions. There is more space in the front for people standing. And you have left the space behind next to you, please squeeze in. But there are six, seven, eight, nine, ten seats here, so that should. Yes. Yeah, so um, it, it seems what you are um, proposing that it's a very fine level of segmentation of these events because it will heavily depend on the granularity of movements, of actions, and so on. And so my question is that um, what happened for the complex events, like birthday party, yeah. wedding, so how, how do you represent that? Um, whether in that the segmentation is also that crucial as you showed here, mm -hmm. or it's more that each of these yeah. sub-events recognition is important. Good. So, <laughs> so the question was, uh, what about coarser grain event structure than we've been talking about here? So um, I give you one little example of segmentation uh, grain right at the beginning. Um, you know, we can manipulate the instructions to push around the grain of segmentation that people report. More generally, our hypothesis is that this architecture that I described is iterated on multiple time scales in the brain from about a second or so to tens of minutes. Um, and there's this interesting regularity where it seems to scale in factors of three. My colleague Barbara Tversky thinks that this is because events have beginnings, middles, and ends, and so you get this levels of three. And that gives you about six levels total going from a second or two up to tens of minutes. Um, on the short end, there's got, you know, this can't apply to really fast events like the decay of subatomic particles. Um, uh, and, it, and it can't apply to really long events like the Hundred Years' War. Um, we think that those <laughs> kind of extreme time scales, actually, when we think about them, we use the same systems, but we do it by basically running little simulations in our heads on a human time scale. Um, there's, as I mentioned, good evidence that within this range from a couple seconds to tens of minutes, that uh, people can adjust their attention to one time scale or another, that these are related to each other hierarchically, such that boundaries between larger events are a subset of the boundaries between finer grained events. Um, and that the, I, this I didn't mention, but the relationship between the fine grained and the coarse grained events can be selectively affected by experience or by clinical conditions. Um, and may be selectively uh, affected by development. So, does that? Yeah, kind of. So, I mean, my question is that what you're saying, that the actual recognition of these um, atomic things <coughs> is not that important as compared to segmentation. I mean, that's what no, I, no, I think recognition is super important. But recognition and segmentation are two different related problems. So, you know, in scene perception, you can have recognition without 
um, segmentation. And like a lot of my colleagues in the early computer models thought that recognition had to precede segmentation, right? Turns out not true, right? You can recognize things based on like, you can recognize objects based on texture without doing any segmentation. And your identification of object categories can feed back and change how you perceive things as, as segmenting. Um, a lot of what we've focused on in my lab is not about recognition, right? It's about feature memory and about segmentation. But, uh, oh. but, um, but both recognition and segmentation are definitely super important at all of these levels, I think. Yeah. We would really have to stick to the time. So okay. I will go and then